Again, I'm Desmond Patton, uh, Associate Professor in Social Work and Sociology at Columbia. I'm um, also the new Associate Dean for Innovation and in Academic Affairs. Um, so I'm trying to think through ways in which we can innovate uh, social work curriculum for the clinical career. Um, but let me just kind of ground you in kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, I did my PhD at U Chicago SSA, and I was doing a study looking at the transition uh, to high school and also trying to understand how young, high achieving black boys um, navigate both violence and um, staying committed to their education. And one of the things that kept coming up in the conversations that we were having with social media, this is back in 2011, 2012. At the time, I, I was active on social media, but didn't really understand the ways in which it mapped onto real world activities. Um, and so the young men were kind of bringing me on board with a situation that was unfolding on Twitter where there were two rappers, um, both um, from the South Side, one GD, one BD, against two disciples, black disciples, and they went back and forth on Twitter because they were, because um, being known and being engaged on social media meant a lot to their status. And so one of the lesser known rappers posted his exact location on Twitter, and within three hours he was killed in that exact location. Um, so I became really curious about um, the role of social media in gang violence and community-based violence here in the city. And so for the past six years, I've been studying that exact phenomenon. I went to literature to kind of see what was happening, to see if there was some way in which we could ground this work. There was nothing there. And so in 2013, with colleagues, we began to pursue this area of work that we call internet banging or cyber banging. So fast forward um, six years later, I'm now chatting with young people from Brownsville, East New York. And Brownsville, East New York is probably very uh, uh, similar to the south and west sides of Chicago. And I was hanging out with young people and, they, and I wanted to know about their social media life. And in particular, how you all, adults, use social media, can use social media to support them, help them, or mitigate issues of violence or school safety. And what they told me was I thought really interesting. And so they said, you know, adults don't get what we do online. They don't understand our language. They don't understand the context. They don't get us. And I was like, well, that sounds normal. It sounds something we probably hear all the time. But then they said, if adults can keep us safe, if they can use social media to keep us from getting hurt or harming others or impacting our community, then we would be interested in that use. I said, okay, well that's something that we can build on. So that's kind of my starting point. Today I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've been doing the last six years, and then if we have enough time, I'm going to demo uh, an, immer an immersive simulation that I co developed with young people from Brownsville, um, East New York. But before we go into all this research talk, how about let's do something uh, interactive. So one of the things that's extremely important in my lab is to pay close attention to culture and nuance and context in social media posts. And so I want you to do the same. So this is a post that um, oftentimes shows up in the social media research that I do here in Chicago. And so 30 seconds, just with your neighbor, ask yourself, what is happening in this post? What is the meaning of this post? So take 30 seconds, talk with each other, and then we'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 
So the reality is that it's super complicated without understanding the text and the emojis that are embedded within the post. Okay. Let me give you a bit more context. So you were right. It was both and. So the reality is is that this post represented a host of emotions that oftentimes are not unpacked when looking at this post, right? So someone was grieving, someone was killed, and someone was smoking weed to make fun of someone that had been killed as well. But without understanding the hyper-local context, without talking to people for whom understand where this comes from, getting anywhere close to this interpretation, the complexity of this interpretation is extremely hard. Let's do one more together. So 30 seconds with your neighbor, what's happening in this post? Well, we, 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 you already know, young people are really interested in standing out. 
and that is important. This is an important time period in which they are developing and pursuing autonomy. Well, then social media is the perfect apparatus to do that because it allows you to be very clear about the identity that you want to create online. And you get to play with different images, and different ways of being, and different ways of speaking, and building different communities in ways that you probably couldn't do outside of this online space. And then it also fits in neatly with this notion and this importance of fitting in and to find those comfortable affiliations and connections that allow you to gain acceptance from your peers in particular. And so what are the ways in which social media impacts adolescent development? Well, we know that there are some clear benefits, that it allows for the deepening of ongoing and new relationships among peers and with others as well. It allows individuals to expand context in new and important directions. For example, um, there are many hashtags where youth in Chicago are talking about the political regime in Chicago and it allows them to hear and learn from other peers around how they're thinking about their own city. Perhaps they don't use the same language that you all may use to talk about the political regime, but they have the same type of engagement and can learn from each other. And then there are new and sustained avenues for support and communication. What I've learned in my work is that social media is a place where young people are engaged in help-seeking behaviors, but oftentimes we don't see them, we don't hear them, because we don't understand them. Now, you probably all understand the challenges very well because it probably hits your community in very diverse ways. You can express dislikes, everything you hate, everything you don't like, people you don't like, people you don't care about, things you don't like, teachers you don't like, social workers you don't like. <laughs> You get to communicate negative activities and get immediate feedback in ways that you probably won't ever be able to get in the physical world. So I can say something about someone or about a community and the people that you're around can immediately respond to that negative post. And they can also transfer to the people who are in that network as well. Communication can reach unintended audiences. How many of us have screenshot something and then send it to someone else. <laughs> so some of us aren't going to be truthful, but I know this happens, right? Well, this really happens to a lot of young people. And it's something that we really need to pay very close attention to. And then it's really complicated to validate what is true, what is honest, what is accurate, what is general information, what is, uh, and what is being shared in this space as well. So let's make this tangible. This is Ja'Kyra Barnes. And she could be one of your students. Chicago Barnes, uh, from the south side, from Woodlawn, just a little bit south of the University of Chicago. And what single parent has a twin brother um, and three other siblings. When she was in eighth grade, her teachers uh, thought of her as being quiet and shy, but a strong student, a B, B plus student. And she loved to sing, and she loved being around her friends. She loved protecting her family. Family was the most important thing to her. And then things in <coughs> Jakira's life changed. And she was hit with the very real realities of living in a community with high rates of gun violence and community-based violence. And so I learned about Jakira in 2014 because her story made national and global news. So the first article I read called her Little Snoop, which is the character from The Wire, for those of you who watched that HBO show a few years back. And they called her the gun-toting game girl of Chicago. By the time Jakira was 17 years old, she had allegedly shot and killed up to 20 people. She was known as a shooter or an enforcer in the Gangs of Disciples. And uh, she, there was this mythology around her that suggested that she was someone you didn't mess with and she would shoot at a moment's notice. And then she had this social media life that many people didn't really know about unless she were in her very embedded social media network. And so in 2014, she was in the 98th percentile of Twitter users. She had 5,000 followers, 27,000 tweets. She was active. She is what we would call now an influencer. 
And so I learned about her because I was interested in going back to that 2013 paper. What might Jakaira tell us about the role of social media and gun violence? And so the story, the end point is that she was murdered, just steps from her home in Woodlawn. She was shot nine times by allegedly by a rival gang. And so I jumped into this research trying to understand if there would be any forms of retaliation that stem from her death and her communication online. Once I started to dig into Jakaira's world on Twitter, I realized that this is more of a diary than anything else, and that there was so much contextual features and knowledge and life that oftentimes we don't leverage in order to support young people. And so there were things like her pictures and understanding the people that she followed and who followed her. There was the biographical information, how she named herself and how she used the username to indicate her identity and, where, and what she felt and who she was. And then all of the hashtags that helped us to understand things like neighborhood identity and affiliation and location. And all of this became the perfect way of doing an assessment on Jakaira's life. And so then we started to pour through her Twitter account. And there were some really important patterns that um, availed themselves as we began to look a bit deeper. Now, let me be really clear. When I started this work, I was only thinking about Jakaira as someone who aggressed, as someone that um, was looking to do harm. And starting with that particular question, well, I found that answer. I found things like Vernon that's the gun line across the independent headlines. Anyone can get these hands in this life. Don't be caught lacking. All of these things became indicators of how she felt about other people and potential threats or sub-threats that could have had some impact on how she navigated the world and how she thought about other people. But what I didn't do is humanize this young black girl. I didn't see her for who she was. I didn't see her as a child. I didn't see her as someone who loved. I didn't see her as someone that cared about all of the things we all care about. But what she did is provided a Twitter account that allowed me and forced me to reckon with her humanity. It smacked me in the face. And then when I opened myself up and allowed her to come through, then I saw trauma. Then I saw stress. Then I saw pain. This woman, the gun-toting gang girl, allegedly killed up 20 people, said things like, my struggle ain't been told. My blood left them in the cold blood. On four and then the ox killed my bro bro. She was impacted by these deaths every single time they happened. And they happened to her often because of the context in which she lived in. She felt deeply and she didn't have a problem with being extremely vulnerable within a context where vulnerability can get you killed. And so Jakaira has been the forefront of the work that we do in the Safe Lab. And so we are an interdisciplinary group of folks. Social workers, young people from Chicago, formerly incarcerated folks, formerly gang involved folks, electrical engineers, data scientists, computer scientists. And we are all working to develop computational tools so that we can extract this very real contextual understanding of human behavior that unfolds in social media and to use it to support the work that folks are doing with violence outreach, in social work, and in mental health. But as you might imagine, and what you all experience, we don't know what the hell young people are saying online. 
And that is the starting place, right? And so we got all excited and thought we were going to do use all these amazing data science and technological tools, but they didn't work on this context at all. They don't work when they don't grapple with human language in ways that are nuanced and that are situated within a particular environmental context. And so we decided to create our own methodology because we wanted to make sure that we privileged culture and that we privileged the true narratives that are unfolding in this space. We want to make sure that we didn't miss that when analyzing this data. And so we created CASM, which is the Contextual Analysis of Social Media Posts. And it is a set of procedures that allow us to look systematically and structurally within Twitter, social media, context, and posts to make sure that we are bringing all of this context, all these contextual features into the application, uh, into an application with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I'll talk a bit more about that soon. But none of this is possible without domain experts. These are young people who live in the communities in which the social media data comes from. Young people who have an understanding of culture and the context. And so these are folks who are from Chicago. And so we partnered with the YMCA here in Chicago. And we identified young people that were interested in internship possibilities, who wanted to give back to their community, and who were interested in issues of safety in their community. So we spent an academic year with them, um, coming back and forth from New York to Chicago and hiring mentors to um, support their, what we call, annotation of social media data and for them to inform the approach in how we look at social media data. Without their expertise, and let be clear, it is expertise, we would not be able to develop any type of artificial intelligence that could work in this space. So let me show you the kind of work that we're able to do with this expertise. So we created an annotation system that allows us to look at social media data. So we pulled, we created a data set that started from Jakira Barnes. We pulled all of her top communicators, people that she had the most mentions and replies with, and we culled it all in a corpus of data, which then uh, created a, a data set of 9,000 users and around 2 million. And so our system that we created, we randomly select social media posts to review. And so what happens is that we ask annotators, so we have domain experts and we have social work students, and then we ask them to look at a social media post without any context. And so in this particular example, I've been up for like three days straight, sad face emoji, kind of like, oh my God, face. And then in, the, in this baseline interpretation, don't get a lot. The annotator tells us he hasn't slept in days. Well, you can kind of already get that from looking at the post. It's not really helpful information. So then we say, well, let's systematically look for context. And so we ask them to look at the original social media post, so we have a direct link to that post. We give them web-based resources, things like hip hop wiki, so that they can have additional context around how to look at words and lyrics and things like that. Go back to the author of the post. We look at the peer network. The peer network is extremely important because someone might be um, performing toughness and identifying as being a part of a tough crowd or being part of an in crowd. We look at the network and they're following Disney characters. So it's not really mapping up in terms of where they actually are connected. Offline events. So oftentimes we get caught up in keywords and phrases. But in our work, we've learned that offline events, things that are happening in the school and in the community, Fights or relationships that have gone awry are key indicators of conversations that you need to pay attention to. We look at the virality of the post. How far reaching it is it? Is it gaining traction? Is the person that's posting an influencer? And who is engaging with that post? So now the annotator's done all that work. And then we say, go back to that post again. Now what do you have to say? And, the, and now the annotator says, the user is saying, that he's been up for three days straight, most likely meaning he hasn't slept for three days. This post comes days after his friend was killed. This user may be having difficulty sleeping because of his friend's death. He includes a persevering emoji and a flush face emoji. So this becomes, this context is richer, more robust, and more helpful in terms of creating computational tools 
that can think like young people, that are more accurate, that are more culturally reflective of the experiences of these young people. And so in our work, we have focused on two sets of psychosocial codes, grief and aggression, because when we did our analysis, we found that grief and aggression were highly correlated, and we also found that grief and trauma oftentimes perceive more aggressive posts. That means that young people, traditionally in our Chicago sample, were using social media to get help, to process trauma, hurt, pain, the things in life that weren't going well. They wanted to process it, they wanted a space where they could just be. And then, over time, we saw a two-day window as that post and the posting behavior became more aggressive as other people, other peers began, began to interject and intervene in how a young person was processing. And so it creates this complicated grief pattern where young people think that they're getting help seeking, they're seeking help, but then can't fully get to where they're trying to go because everyone else has something to say, makes fun of them, or can interpret what they're doing or saying in a vastly different way. And then we have a set of other behaviors that are categorized as other because the complications with doing work in computer science is that it likes binary classifications. And so it's not always easy to include all of those important human elements that you all would be interested in in a classification. So we have to do things in twos. We're working to unpack that in more rigorous ways. And then lastly, before we even send this off to our data science colleagues, we're then trying to understand disagreement. And so we ask those domain experts and our social work students to compare and contrast how they're thinking about these posts. And we've learned that the domain experts have much more backstory. They understand the patterns, they get the people, they understand gestures and ways of being that our best social work students just wouldn't know because they don't have that contextual understanding. And so, we then hand off these uh, contextual labels. So we've labeled the social media data now. So now we've placed aggression or grief or other on tons of social media posts. And then we want to say, well, can I look at millions of posts or hundreds of thousands of people? And in order to do that, you need an automatic system that allows you to do that. And so we partnered with um, two professors at Columbia, uh, Kathy McEwen and Chifu Chang, that use natural language processing and computer vision. And so what we've done so far is that we have ran a set of experiments where we use natural language processing to automatically identify um, grief, aggression, and other in Twitter feeds. And what we have found is that this is really hard. <laughs> and so initially, in our first experiment, our accuracy was around a 60% rate, meaning that we could automatically identify grief and aggression 60% of the time correctly. And then we started to realize that we really need to bring in human rationale and a read of these cultural understandings. And, and once we added that human rationale piece, that context piece, that piece that a social worker could provide, it then advanced the accuracy to around a 71%. And so we will never be at 100% because the reality is I'm never going to really understand what you meant when you posted that thing on Facebook, but we can get close to it. And then that's why it's important to keep humans in the loop in this particular type of process because then in that 30% range, you can provide an error analysis for why the system is getting it, in, getting it incorrect as well. And you can then activate using your own expertise on when to move on something and when not to move based on your day to day. We also have employed computer vision. These are the pictures and the videos that sit on social media as well. And what we've learned is that computer vision is really good at finding things like substance use. So in this picture, you see lean and you see weed, um, and it's really good at identifying aggression, uh, things like guns that may show up in pictures often, um, but it's not so good at understanding grief, and so the natural language processing tools are much better at identifying grief. So you are probably sitting in the audience saying, this is like Minority Report, this is Big Brother, like this is scary, like what are you doing? 
Um, and those are all the concerns that I have too. And we think every single day about the use of these tools and the communities that you work in, and the communities that you're a part of. And so we try to create a set of procedures to keep identity safe. And so we have um, really robust um, uh, agreements with our annotators, with anyone who wants to use our data to make sure that they are not linking personal identification with a social media post, that they're not even looking at social media posts in public spaces, that they're not talking about what they're seeing online outside of the research context. The images that you see um, are not images from our data set, they're from a stock picture group on Google, so we don't use real images from our data set when presenting. And the only time we present actual posts is with Jakaira because her story was headline news, and so we could, didn't make sense to hide her uh, persona. But any other tweet that you see, we will never give you the exact tweet. We will modify it so that you can't go back and look for it on Google search. And so our goal is to then create platforms for outreach workers and social workers to be able to leverage social media in real time to support their efforts. Now, this isn't about identifying people, so we're not going to say Desmond was doing this on this block. We're not interested in giving that type of information. We are interested in elevating events and conversations that bubble up in your catchment area, and then other people using their expertise to then identify the people that they need to connect with, the community members that they need to talk with. And so it provides, and, and the hope is to augment some of that outreach effort because what we've learned is that there's so much happening on social media that it's so hard to keep up with and that you don't have the tools to actually keep up with the pace of conversation that's happening. So we want to help to mitigate that. But there are issues, right? There's bias, there's racism, there's all the things that get in our, get in our way, the things that got in my way and being able to see people clearly and effectively, right? So one of the things that I talk about in my research is digital policing. And the very real issue is that we're not looking at kids in the same way. We're not looking at people in the same way. Here are some examples, right? We have the two examples, Dylan Ruff, the Charleston murderer, and the guy that killed uh, the nine individuals in the synagogue in Pittsburgh. They all had a history of mean and aggressive and hateful social media posts, and we didn't find it until after the fact. But there were a hundred and 100 plus young black boys who lived in a um, uh, 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 apartment complex just north of Columbia. And they had been surveilled for four years and were arrested because of affiliations and images on Facebook, some of which were true, many of which were not true. And so they had proactively pursued young black boys, but then retroactively, after many deaths look at the content of white youth. And so it's important to think about the lens and the biases that we bring to looking at social media and how we apply it. So what are some takeaways? Um, community, so social media is now a community where young people are living and it's not necessarily distinct from the offline world. So this whole talk of virtual world and real world, get rid of that. It's not reality anymore for young people. Social media can be a powerful tool for understanding and preventing root causes of violence. And I think artificial intelligence offers an opportunity to augment and to bolster these efforts as well. But I want to be very clear, I don't think social media or artificial intelligence are the sole answer to a safe school. It's extremely important that they consider context when interpreting and analyzing these posts and to unveil your own bias with considering how you interpret a social media post and how you are applying that interpretation. And this work should never be done alone. You should be working in tandem with people who have that critical, hyper-local context and understanding when applying any of this. So what can social workers do? Ask students and family members to consider a social media break during elevated moments of potential violent events and other traumas or stressors that might be unfolding within the school climate or the community climate. Ask direct questions about student social media use before an incident. 
What we've learned is that a lot of young people are actually trying to de-escalate things on social media. We did focus groups of young people in Hartford, Connecticut, and they said, we tried. I tried not to talk shit, but then they said that one more thing, and it, and it, it kept coming up over and over again. So it's not that young people aren't trying, they need help. They need support. And then, if you're going to use social media, if you're going to leverage this for your outreach efforts and for your social work, create ethical and culturally humble procedures for addressing issues that stem from social media use. So here are some questions you should ask yourself before engaging in a primitive response using social media. Does the text or image give you the full story about the user or the user's network? Do you have a grasp of the context? Do you understand the language that's being used? Could your interpretation be wrong? And how might your implicit or unconscious bias influence how you're interpreting the post and the user who posted it? So, I have a few, we're at 1040, we're good, okay. So, before I end, I actually want to show you a demo that I've created with young people in New York City. So what we've done is I created a tech incubator called Simulation Education. And the point is to help young people understand their domain expertise and to work with them in creating technology tools so that we can have a new pipeline of young, um, underrepresented young people who are now working in technology. And so one of the things that they have done is that they have created an immersive simulation for folks like you. This is called Interpret Me. And Interpret Me was built to help adults practice interpreting social media posts and to unearth any bias that might be in that post and to think critically about how they apply that post. So let me just walk you through a quick demo. So this particular, we have four areas that we're working on now. I'm gonna show you our law enforcement um, simulation. And so there are four stages of practice. You will interpret a social media post. You'll learn about the post context. You'll interact with stakeholders and post feeds. And then you'll choose a response and reflect on your response. So we're going to interpret. So you're going to be notified and shown a live video being streamed to social media content. And then your job is to assess the post. And so this isn't a live video, but this is an example of a live video that you would see. And you would be asked to then interpret what's happening in that post. Exact same thing you did earlier. But to give as much textual information as possible. And then we want to know, what about you made you interpret that post in that way? And so again, you have a chance to really think about what are the things, your, your experience, your life, your observations that inform how you think about these posts. And then you're going to learn different ways of reacting. So we're going to give you some examples of options that you can choose. Sorry, I know it's hard to see with the blue. So we'll just choose one here. Um, send street officers to monitor near where the youth is going. And so the street officers find a few people to speak to while patrolling. The officers show the post and ask, do you know where, the, where to find the group of kids? A well-connected older adult member of the community says, I've seen these kids before. They're on Broadway earlier today. Response from other youth in the community, you get more contextual information from people who are in the community. These are real examples. So we had young people create these scenarios and to provide all the examples of things that they have gone through in their life. And then you have options in this, so you can learn more about different ways in which you can interact and react to these posts. And then you have an opportunity to either learn more or to get other, to explore other learning options. Uh, but first, you know, we want, we want to, to um, grasp, like, what is informing your understanding of your reactions as well. And so it's not just about the interpretation, but it's also about the reactions. And so now you get to interact. Your team will then decide to discuss the post, and you have the opportunity to share your perspective again. Having that real-life opportunity to think critically about how you're deploying or thinking about those posts before you deploy a reaction. 
And then you will have the opportunity uh, to respond to your team as you wish, and you can record a video that then allows us to hear and visually see all of the things that are coming forward when you're looking at a social media post. And then you can get more context around the team's response. And then you have a chance to respond again. And then you have a final response. So before you are finished, you will then be asked to provide one more chance to react and interpret what's happening. And most importantly, brainstorming other opportunities for intervention. What could you have done differently? Who might you want to get involved? And who might be most useful in moving forward with how you use social media? And how do you think about identity? How do you think about things like race and gender of the poster and how that affected your interpretation of the post that you navigated through the simulation? And then what have you learned or taken away from the simulation as well? And so we then kind of put forward where we're coming from with the design of this, right? And so we want to make sure that you understand that we have learned some things around social media behavior and that it's a prime opportunity for us to think about a less punitive intervention when we're applying social media use. And then we also will interview community members and you will see videos of them talking about how social media surveillance has impacted their community. So you get all this information in terms of helping you to think about how you critically use social media in your workplace. And so that's the end of the simulation. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much.